Hello info person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss another mystery coming out of a James Webb Space Telescope in regards to the ancient universe. And in this case, it's the observations of mysterious objects known as quasars that in this case reveals something astronomers really didn't expect. Something about this one quasar here basically creates another mystery. And so let's discuss this in a little bit more detail, but I think first let's actually talk about quasars and especially when they existed in the universe. Although I guess first of all, in case you're not familiar with quasars, it's essentially a galaxy that becomes extremely active because the central black hole suddenly becomes super bright for millions or even billions of years. And because this black hole produces astrophysical jets, and these jets can be extremely bright, when these jets are basically pointed at us, they make these galaxies appear extremely bright from really, really far away. And so quasars and their cousins blazers are essentially some of the brightest objects out there. But interestingly, not so many exist in the modern universe compared to the universe when it was approximately one third of its current age. Actually, here I wanted to start with this somewhat simple graph from University of Alabama. This essentially shows us the distribution of quasars compared to the age of the universe. And you can actually see that by numbers, quasars seem to have peaked when the universe was about 3 to 4 billion years old. And since then, their numbers have been decreasing, but before that, their numbers were pretty low as well. And because of that peak number of quasars, it basically suggests that around this time, most galaxies were probably extremely active, which seem to have activated a lot of central black holes. And if this is a result of galactic formation, and specifically galactic collision, it could actually explain why these black holes became activated, because now we have so much gas falling into them, feeding them very effectively for millions of years. Something that's not as common in modern universe, but I guess surprisingly something that was not very common in the early universe as well. And that's probably because back then the galaxies were much much smaller and potentially evolved in very different ways. But we'll come back to this idea in a few seconds. Because first let's actually discuss this quasar investigated by the James Webb. It was actually discovered kind of by accident using an infrared survey that was technically looking for a lot of different brown dwarfs and maybe some distant galaxies. But in 2011, an unusual red spot was discovered here as well, which when analyzed revealed to be a distant quasar at a redshift of more than 7, which basically implied that this object existed when the universe was only about 780 million years old, with this object basically being about 29 billion light years away from us. And so because this object was actually emitting a lot of UV light, it was eventually redshifted into infrared frequencies. And that's why it was not just visible, but was also extremely bright. This was a powerful quasar emitting huge amounts of energy. And back then, in 2011, this was the most distant such object. Although approximately 10 years later, researchers actually found another one slightly farther away. But because it was so bright and because it was so far away, it basically suggested that this was also an extremely massive object. It was actually producing approximately 63 trillion solar luminosities, which suggested that the black hole here was possibly approximately 2 billion solar masses. And because this was early universe, this already created a bit of a mystery. How exactly would such an object form? And more importantly, how could such a massive black hole form? Interestingly, this was also one of the few quasars detected during the reionization period or essentially when the universe was still not truly transparent. And so a lot of light coming from this quasar is up to 50% obscured by the neutral hydrogen. It's one of the few such quasars known to us, because pretty much all of the other ones already exist in a universe that's much older and that's basically transparent. But because of these emissions involving neutral hydrogen, and because this quasar also showed a major lack of heavier elements, mostly made out of hydrogen and helium, it sort of implied that this was an extremely young object. Or basically the galaxy itself was not even a galaxy yet, it was a proto-galaxy still developing and still forming its true shape. We actually don't even know what they would look like, but here's one of the potential models that make them look like these really large bubble-like shapes because of all of the supernova going off here from various early stars. And though we've actually seen quite a lot of these types of galaxies, especially by all of the recent observations from the James Webb Space Telescope, what was strange about this observation was really the size of the black hole. Its mass suggested that this black hole could not grow to these sizes by feeding normally. Even if it was able to feed at its maximum speed, these so-called 
Eddington limit, it would not grow to 2 billion solar masses in such a short time. And so this actually suggested one thing. This black hole was already born massive right after the Big Bang. And we actually refer to this as the heavy seed model. A model that tries to explain why so many different black holes in the early universe are actually kind of massive. But then there is obviously the other model that basically suggests that maybe there is or there was a way for these black holes to become so massive by feeding extremely fast in ways we don't actually see anymore, thus acquiring these enormous sizes. And so in order to see what's actually happening here and to possibly explain how this black hole and the squeeze are formed, the researchers used the James Webb to try to observe the emissions from the accretion disk. In other words, they focused on the so-called feeding mechanism. And this is actually known as the ultra-effective feeding mechanism. And turns out that JWST's MIRI instrument is actually perfect for that. It's approximately 4,000 times more sensitive than any of the instruments we had before, and it allows the scientists to study the toruses and the accretion disks, thus helping us understand all of the data coming from this quasar, publishing it just now in the study you can find in the description. And the unexpected discovery is that there seems to be nothing unusual about this quasar. It's not actually feeding faster than other quasars, and as a matter of fact, it seems to resemble every quasar we've seen so far in every part of the universe to date. And that by itself is already kind of unexpected. Since all of the properties produced by this quasar are pretty much the same as other quasars, and since this quasar basically seems absolutely normal, no matter what wavelengths researchers looked at, it implies that all quasars seem to grow in the same way, they seem to have very similar feeding mechanics, and more importantly, they seem to have already matured when the universe was only 780 million years old. With the only minor difference observed between this quasar and other quasars was the slightly higher temperature of all of the dust around the quasar that was approximately 1300 Kelvin as opposed to 1200 Kelvin in other quasars, which basically suggests that this quasar is not growing any faster. And more importantly, it suggests that the black hole in this quasar grew through other means. And so this observation directly supports that all of these supermassive black holes very likely start as extremely large and extremely massive seeds in the early universe pretty much right after the Big Bang. And just as other seeds, they served as a kind of a foundation point for many different galaxies to then start to clump around them, eventually forming more complex objects, colliding, and at some point forming modern galaxies. Or at least that's one of the potential current explanations. But interestingly, one of the other studies I've discussed not so long ago, with a video in the description talking about this a little bit more, does actually also discover a tremendous number of really massive black holes in the early universe, comparing to the total mass of the galaxy. And so strangely enough, a lot of these early galaxies, in terms of total mass, were mostly made out of black holes and not gas and stars. The discovery was that it was about 50% or even higher black hole mass compared to gas and stars. But in the modern universe, that mass is usually only about 0.1% or sometimes even less. And so over time, it looks like stars and gas accumulated around central black holes, but in the beginning, it was really the black hole masses that seemed to dominate everything. Or at least that's the observations from the galaxies we're seeing and the galaxies that seem to produce the most energy. Naturally, there were so many other objects that were just not as bright and not as powerful and that we just cannot see with modern telescopes. And so those objects might tell us a different story. But at least for now, based on these observations, it seems to be pretty clear that black holes, the massive black holes in the center of various galaxies, were actually born massive right after the Big Bang. They did not form from some kind of a star collision or from various massive supernova and potentially just collapsed from various over-densities in the early universe or because of super high concentrations of the early gas that just became a black hole almost instantly. And so since we now have several observations confirming this idea, it's now becoming more clear that the universe very likely started with black holes and stars and galaxies very likely came after. Interestingly, the universe might also end with black holes as well. But that's a story for another day and we'll discuss this in some of the other videos. Anyway, on that note, definitely a super intriguing discovery and a really intriguing observation of a super distant quasar that technically shouldn't even exist. Yet it clearly does and it seems to be just like every other quasar pretty much everywhere else in the universe. But at least for now, that's all I wanted to mention. Once we have some other discoveries about this object 
or once we find something else from the edge of the universe that doesn't make sense, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining a channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.